I'm going to be going kind of fast because there's a lot of background in this talk that I can't assume everybody knows. So just I will try and enunciate clearly and, and give people time to think. But, but like I said, there's a lot of ground to cover here. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Modelica, which is a component-oriented modeling language uh, for physical systems. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of my background just so you understand sort of how I came to be here. So I've always been fascinated by programming. I suspect I have this in common with many of you that even as a little kid I was, I was fascinated by programming. I've been doing programming all my life and I, I really find it to be a, just a fascinating field. Um, I was also as a child really interested in math and physics and, and that turned out to be really fortuitous, I think, um, because I find that it's a really powerful combination. Math and physics and science and engineering for that matter give you lots of uh, interesting problems to work on that have computational needs. And knowing how to program and knowing, you know, understanding you know, how computers work and algorithms and so on I think really, really can have a big impact in those fields. So I consider myself fortunate to, to have sort of those, those combined passions that, that have such a synergy together. Ultimately, uh, professionally, I well, or I should say educationally, I, I decided to go into engineering, and so I got a PhD in mechanical engineering. But it, there was always an emphasis in the work that I did on uh, doing on the computational side or the software architecture side of things. But I have I, I worked, for example, for Ford Motor Company. I have always tried to stay in the engineering, the mechanical engineering field. So I've you know worked on you know cars and things like that as part of my work. I'm a contributor to the Modelica specification, to the Modelica standard library, and I've also written two books on Modelica, but I also want to make it clear as part of this background that uh, Modelica effort as a whole was initiated by a guy named Hilding Elmquist. He's considered to be the father of Modelica. I'll talk a little bit more about him later. Uh, the Modelica Association itself, which is a nonprofit that's set up to sort of champion open standards in this area, is chaired by a guy named Michael, uh, by a guy named Martin Otter, who is honestly the hardest working guy that I know. And uh, there are many, many other contributors to the Modelica effort. So um, I just want to make that clear, even though I'm the person giving this talk. So I'm going to start in the beginning, not surprisingly. Uh, I'm going to talk about a time before cat videos, um, before the internet, uh, before personal computers. Before even Lisp itself, we had ENIAC. All right? So ENIAC was the first real computer. This was developed by the government. I'm not sure how many people actually know why it was developed, but I can tell you it was developed to help the military compute artillery firing tables. Essentially, these were simulations. So you all owe your jobs, probably, to simulation, because that was really the impetus for, essentially, the revolution that, that followed. So I decided I would use this problem, actually, as a, as a segue into talking about Modelica. So you can imagine, you know, firing artillery, you know, that's kind of what it looks like when you, the trajectories that you generate. Uh, ultimately, what the government was interested in was generating things like this. This is a table that tells you different firing angles, different wind directions, different air conditions, uh, where, the, where the shells are going to land. That's really what they care about, right? So, uh, that's what they were going after. And this was actually surprisingly difficult to do pre-computing, right? Because you had to have people manually doing this. And of course, that's pretty error prone. Uh, so the math and physics comes in as follows. So uh, there are a set of differential equations that you can use to, to uh, model the behavior of a projectile. I've put together some equations here. I'm, there, you know, there's many different ways you can model these things, and there may even very well be errors in these equations. Um, but you know, they're, they're pretty representative, I think. So this includes things like the wind direction, and, and it essentially takes into account the equations to calculate the position and the velocity of this shell as it's moving through the air, takes into account gravity, things like that. You have to also, with these kinds of systems, you have to essentially initialize them with the proper conditions. So this is an example of how you would get this system moving, which is to say, assuming a certain muzzle velocity from the gun and the, the azimuth and elevation angles, you know, what would be the initial uh, direction that these shells would be heading. So this is the math involved, OK? But then there's the programming. And that's where it gets really sticky. So um, you can imagine, you know, there's, I showed you the equations. There's an example of a differential equation. 
that's a continuous piece of mathematics. It doesn't really lend itself very well to being uh, put into a computer until you discretize it. And so that's the part where we're going to do this discretization. We're going to say, well, we're going to make an approximation here to some of these continuous terms and refer to them in, in terms of successive values of time and successive values of velocity in this particular case. And in doing so, we can take something like this, this equation, and we can transform it into an assignment statement. So I want to be very clear about this. The first thing there is an equation. It's a relationship between expressions. It's not an assignment statement. But what we've done by manipulating things is to get all the terms uh, that we know on the right-hand side and the one thing we're trying to solve for on the left-hand side, and we've turned it into an assignment statement. So, you know, I mean, I think you can look at that and figure out what's going on here, right? We are gonna, we're going to end up with this assignment statement where we calculate the new velocity in terms of things like the drag coefficients, the old velocities, the wind directions, the time step that we're taking, the mass of the shell, and so on. Um, so, you know, you can do it, right? It, it, it's, it, I think the mapping is kind of straightforward there. But there are going to be some themes that emerge as you try and do this over and over again. And uh, one of them is the manipulation required. So for the first thing to note about that manipulation is that it's tedious, time-consuming, and error-prone. And one of the reasons we developed ENIAC in the first place was to avoid a lot of tedious, time-consuming, error-prone stuff. I'm just taking it another step further and trying to get it so that we can not just do all the computations, but we can actually do the math in a way that isn't tedious, time-consuming, and error-prone. Another thing to keep in mind is that I've shown you a very simple equation which can be transformed into an imperative statement easily. But I can tell you it's very, very hard to do this for the general class of problems that Medelica addresses, which is, you know, the formal way of saying that is that these are hybrid nonlinear simultaneous differential algebraic equations, which sounds like a mouthful, and it is. Uh, it's really actually quite hard to deal with these things, especially when you're trying to make a language that allows you to modularly compose these things in a way that non-experts can, can, can engage in that activity and not have to deal with all of the complications that come after it. Um, Another thing to note about the process so far is that it's forced us to prematurely decide on variables in the equations that we want to solve for, which is, is something that, you know, hinders us down the road. I won't go into too much of that now. It also forces us to pick a solution method. You saw that discretization scheme I came up with uh, to, in order to get this thing to be an imperative statement. That's something called forward Euler, and it is the, arguably the worst numerical method possible. It has the value of being simple, and that's about it. And so it turns out that there are lots of different numerical methods that have different properties that you might want to use. But if you mix them in right away together, then they become inextricably combined. It becomes very difficult to change uh, your approach later on. So we don't want to do that either. So let's talk about Medelica, because this helps solve a lot of these issues. So Medelica is a declarative, statically typed language for de uh, describing physical behavior. It's, the goal with Medelica is to encapsulate the mathematical behavior into composable, reusable component models. These are the things that you can then drag and drop together in order to simulate a system. I, I like to think of them as like Lego blocks, but in order to make the Lego block, you have to understand the math that goes on inside. One of the big advantages here is it's going to defer a lot of this really tedious, time-consuming, error-prone, and hard uh, manipulation of equations to the compiler. And I'll talk a little bit about the algorithms involved in that. And the focus really in Medellic is, is on the problem statement. It's on the underlying behavior that you want to model and how you want to compose your systems together. And all of this really hard stuff uh, isn't really, you know, that gets, like I said, deferred to the computer and the compiler rather than to the engineer who builds these things. And I mentioned Hilding Elmquist before. He pioneered this work. In fact, he, did the, he started this work. It's kind of a funny story. He started this work in, during his uh, thesis, his PhD thesis work in the 70s, I think. And computers just, the algorithms involved in doing these transformations are so difficult uh, to, to work with, they, they required so much memory that he basically did his thesis and then had to put the whole thing aside for like 12 years until computers actually caught up to the point where they could handle these kinds of problems in the, in the 90s. Um, but anyway, he helped initiate this Medellica Association, which is a nonprofit that helps advance these kinds of standards. And the Medellica language is something that came out of that. So let's go back to this artillery model I talked about before, and I'm just going to sort of walk you through the syntax of Medellica at a textual level. So when you want to make, there's the complete model, but I'm going to go through sort of step by step. We've got this artillery model. We just, you know, delineated by these model and n keywords. Hmm? Is there, can I make it bigger? 
Yeah, it's going to be on the, I'm going to go through step by step on the right. Um, so uh, the, this has a bunch of uh, uh, parameters, this model. That ha these are the knobs you can turn in building this model so that there's a, there's a mass, there's a velocity, there's a wind direction, there's um, the firing angles, uh, the, the drag coefficients. These are the things that we can sort of play around with, they're, and they're often the, the columns in the table. Uh, in addition, there are some variables that we're going to solve for, the position and the velocity of the projectile as it's coming out of this. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the uh, not finally, actually, next, the initial equations, which are going to describe the initial conditions of this simulation. You'll notice a couple of things here. One is that uh, you know, there's a vector notation that you can use when, when describing mathematical equations. And then uh, finally, and, and maybe most interesting, is the behavior. And here you will see uh, the two things. You'll see the continuous equations uh, th that we saw before, essentially, uh, just represented in, in Modelica. So these are, have time derivatives of, of different terms in here. Uh, we have vectors. We have all the different uh, parameters that we talked about before. These are continuous equations, continuous differential equations. They apply at all times. In addition, we can describe discrete behavior. And you see down here this when clause. So this essentially doesn't apply all the time. This applies once the projectile has hit the ground, and then we stop the simulation. So this is our way of signaling that this is the end of the simulation. There are other things we can do. If you're simulating, for example, uh, logical circuits, you could have you know, behavior related to gates changing values and things like that. Uh, so that's just an example of a Modelica model, just to give you a concrete sense of what Modelica looks like and is. Uh, if you take that model and then you simulate it, for example, for different headwind values, when firing a shell, you'll get a trajectory out of it like this. So that's probably what you'd expect, at least intuitively, qualitatively. Um, so now let's talk about the compo component-oriented aspects of the language. So I mentioned before that the goal here is to have people like engineers compose these things by dragging and dropping pieces together. And in order to do that, we need to, we need to go beyond this just writing out a bunch of equations in a flat way and need to, to create components, reusable components. So the first thing we have to think about is how these components are actually going to communicate with each other. And when you're programming in an imperative sense, you can think of functions and you can think of them as having input values and output values, but we don't really have that here. Instead, what we have is uh, points at which different components interact. But there's no real input or output. You know, when you think about a resistor, you don't think about it as having voltage as an input and current as an output. It, it, it just is a thing that has a relationship between voltage and current. But, but actually, how that uh, plays out depends on the other things that it's connected to. So uh, we have this concept in Medellica of what's called a connector. So given a resistor, we would generally think of a resistor as having two ends to the resistor. We can just arbitrarily call one the positive end and one the negative end. And in that case, uh, we, what we do in Medellica is, for electrical components, we define this connector. And the connector uh, says that there are really two pieces of information that we're going to associate with each end of this resistor. There's going to be a voltage at that point, and there's going to be a current that's flowing through the wire at that point. So those two things are defined here in this, in this connector definition. The fact that current flows through the element you can, is indicated by the fact that there's a flow qualifier in front of it. And once we have this, then we can, we can actually use it in describing how we would build a resistor. So let me walk through that process. I suspect a lot of you have been exposed, for example, to Ohm's law. So let's just walk through this. So Ohm's law, most people think about as V equals IR. Being a little more rigorous about it, it's actually the, what it says is that the voltage difference across the resistor, which is that first term there, VP minus VN, is equal to the, is proportional rather to the, to the current flowing through the resistor. Right, so that's, that's a slightly more rigorous statement. What that means in Medellica is, going back again to that diagram of a resistor over there, what we do is we say we're going to create a model of a resistor. It's going to have this resistance parameter. That's a knob we can turn. Different resistors that we instantiate can have different resistance values. Each one will have a pin. We're going to arbitrarily, again, call one of them P and one of them N. So those are you know, the positive and negative terminals on the resistor. And then we can create in the equation section a description of that, that component's behavior. Ohm's law comes into play here. We see right there, we're going to take the, the voltage at the positive pin, subtract the voltage at the negative pin, 
and set that equal to the current flowing through the resistor times the resistance, right? That's Ohm's law. There's another thing we need to keep in mind about a resistor, and that is that it doesn't actually store any charge. And so that second equation is really just a formal way of saying that whatever comes into this resistor in the form of, of current is going to flow back out again. And that's it. Now we have a resistor model. And we can then compose that with other systems now, or other components. So let's talk about those other components. Uh, typical examples of simple electrical systems or electrical components would be capacitors or inductors. So let's walk through that process. These are the equations for the behavior of a capacitor and an inductor. It's not super important to really have an intuition about what those really mean. I just want to point out that they are relationships between the difference in voltage across the component and the current. So this is actually slightly familiar because we saw this same, essentially the same thing with the resistor. The equations are slightly different, but the, big, the main players here, the voltage difference and the current, are still there. So I'm going to use that as an example to introduce how, we, um, how inheritance comes into play in, in Medelica. So what we want to do is we want to factor out the common aspects of these different pieces, the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor. And if we look at this model, and you'll see here this model says partial, which means it's, it doesn't represent a complete description of physical behavior. It's, only a, it's like a base class. Uh, this partial model has many of the same characteristics we saw before in the resistor. It's got two pins. It's, it has uh, actually internally two variables, V and I, which represent the voltage difference in the current. And it also has a conservation equation that says that whatever current goes into the component goes back out again. These are going to be the common properties of all the components that we're going to show. And so I factored them out into a base class. And in doing so, what that allows me to do then is to describe the behavior of the resistor like this. So um, the resistor model then just simply extends from two pin, gets everything in there that uh, is defined, and focuses on what makes a resistor unique versus a capacitor or an inductor. So, and that is the fact that it has a resistance and that it has Ohm's law. And because we've created these helper variables over here on the left, the voltage and the current, V and I, we can write Ohm's law actually in the form that most people are most familiar with it. But we can then use that same, reuse that same code uh, to create a capacitor and to create an inductor. So now we're sort of, now we're moving. Now we've got a few components that we can put together. So let's do that. So now if we wanted to create a network of components, here's an example that's purely textual. So uh, in Medelica, you can not only just declare simple scalar variables and equations, you can actually compose systems hierarchically. So what that means is that when I create a model like of an RLC circuit, I can instantiate within there resistors, capacitors, ground elements, the, the, the components that you typically see there, a step current, for example, to excite the system. Those all have parameters, so you can see in the resistor where R comes into play here. We're going to set the resistance to be 10. And then in the equation section, instead of having equations like V equals IR at this level, what we're actually going to do is we're going to establish connections. So those connect statements are actually equations. What they stand for is the idea that we're going to, they're, they're like wires connecting the resistors and the capacitors, but they're idealized. There's no losses in them, you know, energy and charge are conserved across those pieces. So essentially what those connect statements are is a, an abstraction of, if you're familiar with Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law, they're in there to tell us that essentially these are just ways of connecting the components, they aren't behavior themselves. And they will generate a bunch of equations, as we'll see in just a second, automatically for us. Um, so I want to show another example that's a little more practical. This is an example of an industrial robot model in Medelica. And if we dig down into this, I just want to show you the sort of the hierarchy of a, of a more complex model. So we start off at the top level. There's a mo model of the mechanical aspects of the system, you know, 3D pieces of the system. And then there's models of each individual axis, which involves a motor and a control system. And if we bore down into each of those axes, you then get a, a model that looks like this, where you've got a set of gears, you've got a motor, you've got a controller, you've got some sensors. And then if we bore down even further into just the, uh, the motor itself, we see resistors, capacitors, operational amplifiers, 
some gain blocks, uh, some rotational inertia, some EMF effects. This actually illustrates the fact that Medellica is a multi-domain modeling language as well. You can model electrical systems, mechanical systems, thermal systems. I mean, the, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, and so this is a, a, an example where it combines different engineering domains in a single component. So this is a, an example of an industrial robot. Um, this model is not a particularly big model. It's a demo model from the Medellica Standard Library, but still it has 4,000 variables in it that need to be solved for. Uh, there's ultimately 3, uh, 1,342 parameters in there. Those are the resistances of all the resistors or the gains on the operational amplifiers. Uh, and there's a way of essentially cascading the, the, the design of the robot down into those components. But ultimately there's, there's almost 500 components in this model. So let's look at how this actually turns goes from components into equations. Right, what you see on the, on the left is a diagram of a bunch of components. This is how a user might actually build a system, dragging and dropping the components down, connecting them up. This is a, a nice, safe way to build the system. They're not manipulating equations. They're not doing anything that they can, they can really make too many mistakes about except connecting them in the wrong way. Um, and believe me, there are many mistakes to be made, so we're, we're avoiding a lot of problems there. But that diagram on the left is equivalent to the equations I've shown on the right, and I want to just walk through how that mapping is done. So you'll see uh, those connections that you see in the diagram over there are uh, essentially translated into the equations you see at the top here. These are uh, essentially uh, conservation laws for the electrical circuit and, and essentially kinematic constraints on the voltages, not exactly kinematic constraints, but algebraic constraints on the voltages in the, in the between the components. And then what you see here, each of these equations are generated component by component and as, as essentially flattened equations so that they, all the variables have fully qualified names within the hierarchy of this particular system. Uh, so it generates all of these different equations uh, from the different components. And so this is essentially the flattening process that goes on in Medellica compilers, which translates the components into the equations. And now we're all going to take the red pill and see how deep this rabbit hole goes because there's really a lot that, that goes on after this. This is just the beginning. Um, so I'm going to take you inside the matrix, and I really mean a matrix. That's a, that is a mathematical matrix on the side there. It's a dense matrix. And um, you see here that if the equations on the right, but if we treat each of the variables in there as a column, and then each equation, we pull out the coefficients for that variable as a row, then you get the, the dense matrix I've shown you on the left. And uh, there's something to, really important to understand about matrices when you're trying to simulate things, and that is the computational complexity of inverting them, which is a necessary step in solving them. i uh, point out over here that Gauss-Jordan elimination is an n-cubed uh, uh, order of computational complexity. So that's that's, that's high, that's three cubed is pretty bad. And in your sort of best case here, you're getting down to n to the 2.3. So this, this doesn't scale too well, right? This is a problem. Uh, you remember that, that problem I just showed you, which is a relatively small problem, 4,000 variables. Okay, so now we're, we're taking 4,000 to the 2.373 in the best case scenario. Um, now the thing is, uh, we can do something called equation sorting. Uh, we can go through and we can look at these equations and say, you know, there's something interesting about these equations. If we look through every, if we look for an equation where the right-hand side is known, we, can, we see at the bottom there's an equation where the right-hand side is known. We know the voltage at ground is zero. So that means we actually know the voltage at the ground. And if we know the voltage at the ground, then it's a known in that equation on the, on the right-hand side. And so we know the capacitor's negative voltage. And if we know the capacitor's negative voltage, then we know this, and so on and so forth. So this is actually what's called equation sorting. And uh, the result is that, you know, what if I told you that that wasn't a dense matrix at all? It's actually a lower triangular matrix. It, it, by just simply swapping the columns and the rows, and the trick is knowing which ones to swap, of course, but by swapping the rows and the columns, we now have a lower triangular matrix, which is order n to solve. So we, and, and in fact, translates pretty much directly into a set of assignment statements that we can just throw into any imperative context. So we've gone from, for like a simple model, 4,000 variables, computational complexity of n to the two and a half-ish, down to just n, 
for 4,000, for N equals 4,000, that's, that's huge, and we are just starting. Uh, I mean, this is, this is just the first step in doing all this processing. So, as I said, you know, the, this, is, this is a deep rabbit hole. So this is really just the tip of that iceberg here. Um, I've shown you the uh, equation sorting and the BLT form. Uh, it turns out that I mentioned before we get these nonlinear simultaneous hybrid differential algebraic equations. It turns out differential algebraic equations in general are not even solvable with computers. You actually have to do this process of index reduction in order to be able to numerically evaluate them. Um, so we need to do that. that that is pretty complicated. Uh, then you have to do state selection. Depends, there's a bunch, of, you have to pick which variables you actually want to solve for, in a sense, and, and that uh, makes a big difference in whether the systems are singular or not. Then there's things like tearing, which give you further benefits when you have to deal with nonlinear systems and iterating over variables. There's, we, in mechanical systems, the robot is what's called a tree mechanism. You know, it, it just kind of hangs out in, in air, but if you look at uh, other mechanisms that are closed mechanical loops, once they close, they become over-constrained, so you have to know which equations you can sort of remove from that system and still get a correct answer. And then finally, we haven't even talked about the discrete aspects of the language really, except for that one when clause. When you talk about um, uh, synchronous systems, you then have to deal with clocks and partitioning and solving simultaneous equations on clocks. And so there's a whole, a whole other warren to go through for that part of the rabbit hole. Um, so I'm just trying to get you to understand that there's, there's actually quite a bit in terms of algorithms that are required in order to enable this kind of functionality. There are a number of different tools out there. Most of them are commercial, but uh, the, the tools that support Modelica, most of them are commercial, so I've listed a couple of them there, and uh, several of them were actually kind enough to give me licenses uh, to help prepare for this talk. So uh, I've math, um, Wolfram is a sponsor at this event, and you can uh, see their booth upstairs. I also got licenses from Maple and Daimola. Uh, to help prepare this material. So um, there are also some open source implementations. There's an implementation called OpenModelica. There's another implementation called JModelica. So if you want to explore those kinds of things. Um, so now I had a little bit of a tangent. I, I kind of went through that stuff a little quickly because I wanted to hopefully have time to talk a little bit about the, these next two slides. So I uh, had the great pleasure of being able to spend about two hours a couple years ago one-on-one uh, -on -one with Brett Victor talking about this kind of stuff. I, he, he actually has an engineering background um, in electrical engineering, I think. And uh, I was bowled over to, when I met him to find out that he actually had heard of Modelica. You know, this is something I'd worked on for a long time, but I just, you know, it's kind of a niche thing. So it was, it was kind of neat that he, he knew about it. And I was then bowled over even more when he, uh, in he, when he wrote his essay, uh, what, what Can a Technologist Do About Climate Change? He actually had, uh, he included a mention of both Modelica and one of my books on Modelica in that essay. And uh, he asked a really interesting question in that essay, which was, what if there were an NPM for scientific models? And I know this is something that Brett had, has been working on with his, um, I think his framework was called Tangled, I think, or, and uh, for being able to have sort of documents that had live mathematical behavior in them. And uh, so it turns out that in the time between when I had spoken with him and him writing this essay, in fact, I had, along with a couple of other collaborators, written a package manager for Modelica, which in a sense is meant to be like an NPM for scientific models. And that, that package manager is called Impact. Um, but I don't actually even want to talk about that really. Um, what I, what I, but his, his question was sort of, especially in preparation for this talk, was kind of rattling around in my head. And I thought, well, you know, that is an interesting question. What, what really prevents us from using NPM itself as a, a way of being able to manage scientific models? Now, I want to make a distinction here. There are scientific models that are algebraic. You can think of those as like Excel spreadsheets, okay? And that's pretty straightforward. But what I want is something a lot more aggressive. I want to be able to take the models like I've shown you here and to be able to use them from NPM, right? That means actually being able to perform a simulation, being able to get trajectories, time series data out of them. But I thought about this, and so I thought, okay, well, let's, let's see what we can do. So this is what I came up with. So this is, uh, you know, just a, a session, and you can see the, the uh, you know, how it sort of plays out. At the top, I say NPM install this exogeny artillery demo. This is a, the model that I showed you earlier uh, that can calculate artillery trajectories. Uh, 
so that gets installed, right? I made this as a, as a private NPM module for this experiment. And then I run Node, and then in there I can just require that module. And then once I've, re once I've imported that, I now have this ability with that, that model to be able to say, okay, I want the trajectory you know, the, from this the simulation. And I can specify things like the azimuth and elevation angles as inputs. I can specify that I want the Z, which is the height of the thing, to be a trajectory that it returns to me. And then I can specify that I want the final values of X and Y, which is ultimately what you care about with the artillery, is where did it actually land, right? And so this isn't, this isn't a mock-up, this, this really worked. Um, and so it's just an interesting demonstration, uh, sort of in some sense an answer to, to Brett's challenge about why don't we have NPM for scientific models. I mean, we can, we can have that. Uh, and it, it, it's, it can be remarkably easy to use, right? It's just like this session indicates. So this, and interestingly enough, you know, they're given this, then this provides a, a means for being able to incorporate these kinds of uh, analyses into the back end, into the front end via Webpack. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting things that this opens the door for because NPM is so ubiquitous. So anyway, I just wanted to try and answer uh, that sort of challenge from Brett. Um, if you're interested in Medelica, you can go to medelica.org. That's the primary website for Medelica. If you are curious, there's a, a tour, an interactive web tour of Medelica that I created uh, on my site. So that's at tour.exogeny.com. And you can actually type in Medelica code and run simulations and plot results and things. And it walks you through a series of lessons uh, just from the beginning. Um, and then I, uh, as an interesting sort of aside, I, I had a project uh, two years ago uh, where I, I, I wrote a, the first book on Medelica back in 2001, and I wanted to make something that was more accessible because it was a, the original book was a textbook. It was fairly expensive, and I wasn't really happy about that because my goal in writing the book wasn't really to make money. It was to make that material accessible to anybody. So I, I started this effort in, I think it was 2013, maybe, uh, to crowdfund the development of a new textbook and the, I, with the idea that the book itself would be available electronically for free, thus solving my problem of making the material accessible. And I was fortunate that I, I, the Kickstarter campaign was successful and, and uh, uh, I, I got a bunch of sponsors for it, uh, including, I should mention, Wolfram, since they're here. And uh, I created the, this book as essentially a crowdfunding effort. And so now you, know, you can go there and the, the book features is not only a book that you can read through, um, but it, has, it features also, much like that tour, interactive web-based examples of the models that are in there. So instead of a classic sort of engineering textbook where you have just plots in the web version, the plots actually have, are applications that you can open up and specify different values for parameters and re-simulate them through your web browser. So that was just an interesting project. Uh, and finally, I'll mention Impact, because I mentioned it earlier, uh, which is not quite as, I think, not as compelling or interesting for an audience like this, because Impact is really about managing the models themselves as components. Uh, I, I, I included the NPM example because I think it has more impact, no pun intended, because it, it allows people to actually run the simulations. It's not about managing a bunch of, of, of sort of abstract component models. It's actually about being able to take a real system that's been assembled and, and bring it to life. And so that's the simulation part. So I mean, that's why I thought that was pretty interesting to include. But impact is, is out there and it's used for essentially in the same way that NPM is for, mod, for managing all of these different libraries of components that are out there. And uh, with that, I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for attending. And you can look at an example of an animated Modelica model. So I've got time for questions, if anybody has any. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, so one thing to know about Medelica is that it can't solve any problem you give it. I mean, the, you know, obviously things can be singular, so you're, you're stuck there, but there are also classes of problems where it's just simply, the algorithms themselves can't handle it. Uh, but I would say that Hilding Umquist and, the, and some of the other people like Martin Otter, and there's, there's several other that I should name, um, 
have worked really hard on the algorithms for those things to make them apply to the broadest range of things possible. So with respect to differential algebraic equations, the thing is, like a, a, uh, an index, their, their, their sort of difficulty is classified by indices. So there's index one, index two, index three, all the way to index infinity. So generally speaking, like one and two, index, index one and two can be solved. Some classes of index three can be solved. And then basically after that, it, it really can't, it, in, you really can't solve them without doing something to them, without these transformations. Those transformations, uh, it's interesting. I mentioned that Hilding started this work in like the 70s. It turned out there was a really s sort of stunning breakthrough in the, I think it's in the 80s, when a guy named Pantelides came up with something called the Pantelides algorithm, which does this index reduction. And it's, it's kind of amazing to me because it, it opened the door for so much stuff to be done. I mean, it solved this really tricky problem uh, pretty cleanly. And, and it just changed the way that people view uh, doing this kind of modeling. So it, it's a pretty, important accomplishment. But uh, that, that opened the door to more of these things. But um, there are different techniques that are used. The Pantelius algorithm is the main one. But you know, it has limitations. But I, you know, I, mean, I can't tell you what they are right here. But, but I, I can tell you in practice as, a, as an engineer, as a practicing engineer, I've, the, the only problems that, we, that I would say I ever still have with respect to that limitation are what are called variable index problems. A typical example of a, of a variable index problem is like a trebuchet, where you have the ball in the basket, it's part of the mechanism, and then at some point it separates out, and it has more degrees of freedom because it's not part of the mechanism. Uh, or impacts when things hit each other, where a ball is free, and then it hits a table, and then it's, it's, it's not free, and then it bounces, and then it's free again. So that variable index stuff is still a, a frontier for improving these algorithms. But that's about the only one I run into in practice. Yeah. It won't let you violate conservation of energy. That's part of the, that's part of the trick here. I mean, in, inside your component models, you can do crazy stuff like make energy out of nothing. You know, I mean, that, that part is, is on you. Um, but once you're outside the component model, that, that whole thing I showed with the connect statements, their whole purpose is to apply conservation laws everywhere. And so they're accountants. You know, they're making sure everything gets accounted for outside the component model. So inside the component model, it's your problem. But outside, it takes care of all the rest of the stuff. So you can be pretty much sure that as long as you're not breaking it explicitly in the equations that you add, that it's not going to break it when it assembles the whole system. Yeah, well, that was one of the reasons I wrote the book, was to give uh, professors, for example, a, a way of being able to just point students at something. Um, I, you know, I'm honestly not sure how many different, I know lots of professors in the Medellica community. I'm not sure how many of them are teaching it, to be honest. I mean, I'm not in that community. I'm not in the academic community, so I don't really know what, what it is. I mean, if you, if you ask me, they should be, but I, I mean, not, not just, I don't mean to say they should be using my book per se, but I mean, they should be teaching this, because as a practicing engineer, I found it very, very useful. So. so, you got a need to uh, uh, reduce the complexity of the matrix conversion and equation sorting. What's yeah. the uh, complexity of equation sorting? Uh, that's a good point. The thing about equation sorting is it's only done once. It's not done at every runtime, right? And in fact, it's not even, in fact, it's very clever the way that these algorithms work because what they'll do is if the, if the coefficients in the, very, in the matrix change with time, uh, then you have to do that back substitution, that order and operation every time. But the compiler can actually determine through dependency analysis whether the coefficients even depend on time. And if they don't, it can actually do all those calculations at the start of the simulation. So at every time step, it doesn't even have to repeat them. So there's a huge, I mean, the optimizations are, are staggering that can be done for these simulations. That's just one example of how the compiler could be really clever about saying, well, I, know, I don't even need to do this every time. I, I can see that this isn't going to change every time and do it all up front. Yeah. Okay. So 
Right. So the question is really, if you have two different sort of models, how do you make them interoperate together? And, and I want to point out that I never actually did that, and that was very conscious. What, what, what the, the, the best way to do this is to put all the components together in Modelica, let the compiler chew on that, and spit out code. Okay, not to break it up, because you then forego a lot of optimizations. Now, let's say there's a problem where you can decouple the models reasonably. Uh, the typical example is when you build controllers for systems, you can decouple them. And then I would say you should look at, so, there's something called FMI, which is what I actually used in part for that NPM stuff, which is essentially a way of being able to, uh, the way I describe it is it's like an EXE format for models. It's a way of being able to compile a model down into executable code. Uh, that can then be exchanged. And so that's also a Modelica Association standard. I didn't bring that into the scope of this, but it's, it's also a whole standard for how to do that and how to allow simulations, essentially models to be simulated as software components within other systems. So I would just refer you to that. There's a website, fmi-standard.org, that talks about that standard. Okay, we're, okay. I'll take one more. Uh, I'll, here, you in the back there. Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, so that, was, that would be a layer I would wrap around this whole thing. So you can for sure have all these parameters in here, and there are many tools like EyeSight and HEADS, and uh, I've, I forget the names of some of the other ones, but there's a bunch of these kinds of tools that do that kind of Monte Carlo analysis, for example, uh, stochastic stuff on top of this. It's not super important to actually have it in the models because it really is a layered on top. It's like an, a for loop wrapped around the outside. So yeah, I mean, and FMI enables that as well because you can take a model and treat it as a simulation, as a software component, and then you can just stick it into a for loop. So, so that's how most people would accomplish that. So I, I'll, I'll cut it off now because I'm sure you're all hungry. Uh, but I thank you all for your questions and for attending, and I'll be around if you want to ask me questions. <laughs>